Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This week on the Garden DC podcast, we're joined by Marianne Wilburn, frequent guest and friend of the show. Welcome, Marianne. Hi, Kathy. Hey, so I should also note, you're not just a frequent guest and friend of the show, but you're also a garden author and writer, and you have your own blog, and you're part of the Garden Rant Empire. (laughs) <laughs> are we an empire now that's all that's empire. how i'm thinking of that it's like does that or, mean that we can take over something <laughs> <laughs> well you're at least dynastic how's that how <laughs> so we'll we'll uh cover all that uh coming up but our main topic today will be on your new book on tropical plants and so we'll talk about how we can have a tropical plant garden in a not tropical climate how's that yeah and That's exactly what we're going to talk about. Yay. So first, let's talk about you. So I have to ask, like I ask many of my guests, were you born with chlorophyll in your veins, Marianne? Uh, my mother would say definitely not, um, <laughs> because I shied away from work in the garden just as much as your average kid. Um, but I had the example of my parents, who were avid gardeners, both vegetable and ornamental gardeners and a very close family friend who was an ornamental gardener on the scale of people that I know now, you know, that just sort of crazy geeked out um, plant, uh, passionate plant lover. And so I had those examples. And as I got into my early 20s, uh, I started, I I really wanted to garden and I had that urge to do that, even in the midst of all of the other uh, things that I was doing in life and and my career path wasn't horticulture at the time, it was theater. And uh, so I always had a garden in the background, gardening, whether it was vegetable or ornamental was always in the background uh, for me. And uh, I, my, my degree is not in horticulture either. I always think of my, uh, I, I think of my unofficial degree because I have probably done more reading and more writing on horticulture than I have done on my actual degree, which was in archeological photography. So, um, it's, you know, you're one of those those people who just is constantly reading and constantly trying to get better in your profession and a profession that I only started about oh about 13 years ago when I started writing a, a column for uh, a local paper and then it went on to other papers and then it went from there to uh, blogs and magazines and that sort of thing so I was able to put two great loves of my life, which were writing and horticulture together. And I haven't looked back since. Yeah. And we could say you're an expert gardener because you've probably far surpassed that 10,000 hours uh, minimum that they talk about for mastering any topic. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I think that was last week. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It feels like I think it. I put 10,000 10, hours in last week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been that kind of spring, it feels like, too. <laughs> well, I think horticulture is one of those areas that you really can become very good um, at what you do if you put enough time and energy and thought into it and you take the time to study and to learn from others, to go to lectures, to go to tours to always be reading, to always be learning from your garden. This is not something I think you can just do with books. In fact, I, you know, you could if you were in prison, I suppose (laughs) you could do a lot of it, but you really need that experience. And the more experience that you get in the garden, 
the more you realize, oh my gosh, there's not enough time to be able to gain all the experience I still need. You know, there's, you need lifetimes for some of these things, differences in weather patterns and the way that plants respond to soil temperatures. And it, you can get into the weeds so quickly. And it's a, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic discipline. And so true that the more you learn, the more you realize, I don't know anything about this topic. <laughs> the more you take a deep dive into something, you're like, there are 10,000 other things that I need to learn here. Yeah. And um, one of the best ways of doing that, if you're actually working in horticulture, is to move to a whole new area, a whole new climate. And then you've got a completely new palette of plants, just a new country. And you may think you really know your stuff. But you stand in front of, a, a, you know, a different region's plants and you may know them just from books, but you don't grow with them. And there's nothing like growing with a plant in order to know a plant. And, and, to, and to a certain extent, that's what, you know, tropical plants are so unfamiliar as, as a plant palette to your average temperate gardener. Uh, and so that is actually why I uh, why I wrote this book was is for northern gardeners for temperate gardeners. I segued in there. How'd you like that? <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah, I would say that a lot of us are familiar with tropical plants more as a house plant. Yeah. Um, and maybe we've had it for years, and then we hadn't even thought about, hey, this could actually be outside for the summer, or maybe even longer for some of them. Yes, I mean. There are are so many tropical plants, subtropical plants, and and I actually I, I want to make that clear. I there's only so many uh, words that one is allowed to put on the cover of a book, and I was really pushing the limits there, or rather my <laughs> my publisher was. The title is so long, and this really should be titled "Tropical and Subtropical Plants and How to Love Them," uh, because we work with probably almost more subtropicals than we work with tropical plants. So when I say tropical, think of both of those categories um, and, and both of those areas. Uh, so uh, for house plants, many of those are tropical or subtropical plants, and many, many, many of them can come outside and get a summer vacation. I am really trying to push that right now, although it's a little cold at the moment, as well you know. I think it's, we're just getting over that hump. I think we're about to be able this weekend, um, at least in the mid-Atlantic U.S., to put out our house plants. But huh, always keep an eye on that always, nighttime temperature. Yep. I always keep an eye. I, I put some Sansevieria out last week, and and I have a lot of it in the house. So it, it was a bit of a sacrificial lamb, but it's actually done very well. It's fine. But I like to say that if you're walking around your garden with a jacket on, not just like a light cardigan, but a jacket, it is too cold for you to be thinking about putting your houseplants out. And yesterday I was walking around my garden with a jacket on, you know, at dusk you know, to, to bolt up my cold frames. Uh, so that's, that's you, you need the temperatures to not be too cold at night. Uh, to, mm -hmm. So that you don't set them back as you're bringing them out, because it takes a long while for a plant to fight, you know, get in fighting shape to be outside. Yeah, I like that light jacket rule, although some of us run hotter than others. And That's true. I tend to be still in a parka in April, so. <laughs> yes, but you see, I'm a child of the sun, remember? I'm from California, <laughs> and I, I, I'm still feeling the chill from moving over here 20 years ago. <laughs> still still deep in your bones right there <laughs> it's still deep in my bones and one of the worst things Kathy which you probably maybe experienced is when it gets really warm like it did we had some really warm days there a week ago or a week and a half ago maybe 80 um in the 80s definitely and then when it gets cold again I am so done and I feel like it is frigid arctic air uh and I'm just annoyed and here I am, I'm the biggest advocate for get your butt outside, put a jacket on, put some gloves on, put a hat on, and get outside. But the minute that shift happens, then I'm the world's biggest wimp. 
Yeah, and, and normally gardeners are pretty resilient and tough people, but it's it's tough when spring gives you one step forward, two steps back. One step forward, two steps back with the hails we've had, the winds we've had. It's been an up and down spring, but a lot of the garden outside has been loving it. So let's talk about your garden for a minute because I know mine is growing you know, by leaps and bounds, super lush this year. I think my roses are the best they've ever been. Mm -hmm. Uh, My Wygelia shrubs are just explosions of flowers. The peonies are looking great. So those that like a long, cool spring are really having a, a great time of it. How about in your garden? They sure are. The rhododendrons are looking absolutely beautiful. The Solomon seal is looking just fantastic. All of these things that don't really want to be burnt too much. Uh, this year, I was so overwhelmed by uh, Talia daffodils that I put in just as a sort of, oh, Brent and Becky's has got a big special on a lot of them, so I'll, I, I want to put those in. And I, I bought a bunch and put them in. Boy, they just carried the late, the, the spring for me, that late white, elegant daffodil. And it just brought all those greens out and the silvers out. Oh, I just adored them. Um, they're finishing up now, but still, with this cooler weather, uh, they've been in. Uh, my uh, uh, Edgeworthia, I did a very scary prune of, and uh, it's probably the scariest pruning job I've ever done because it is such a high-value plant to me, and I have given it its its reins and let it just sort of go. and. I pulled out about a third of it last year in preparation for bringing it down a peg or two. And I did that pruning oh, about two, three weeks ago. And I've been watching it like crazy and it's just starting to bud. So I think we're out of the, I think we're out of the woods with it, but just a lot of pruning jobs. A uh, lot of fur, the ferns are outstanding right now. They're absolutely outstanding. I have so many different kinds here because, you know, with the being down in this valley, it's it's fern country, USA. (laughs) Yeah. And for our listeners um, who might not have caught the previous episodes you were on, can you describe your location a little bit for everyone? Yeah, I'm sort of I just am, am down deep in a dell, as they would say, and Uh, A stream runs through the property. We're very, very fortunate to have that. And so it's usually at least 7 to 10 degrees cooler here than it is in the summertime uh, in my actual town. If if you're up at the top of the road and it's beating down sunlight and uh, in July heat at you, you're going to be almost 10 degrees cooler at my house. It's extraordinary. And that's just because of all of that, um, all of that vegetation and all of that tree cover. So I'm surrounded by a woodland. Some of it's mine um, and some of it's my neighbors and some of it's the bears. And and, uh, it's a very lovely natural place. I could, I could not garden anything at all and it would be, it would be lovely. And uh, for those listeners, Marianne is not kidding about the bears, um, and she's, what are you, a mile from the Potomac River? As the crow flies, I'm As about, crow flies. Okay. I'm probably about um, maybe a quarter of a mile or a half a mile. And so you're on the Virginia side of the river and very close to the West Virginia border as well. That's right. We're in the tri-state area different (laughs) tri-state. And let's talk about animals for a minute since you brought up the bears, who I can't imagine how adorable those bear cubs are, but how destructive they might be for gardening. Um, In a previous episode, we had you talk about uh, keeping chickens and realistic expectations for those, but also you waxed poetic about your ducklings. So how, how are all of those doing? I did. You know, the ducks have been such a surprise to me because I am not overly um, soppy. Let's just say that. I'm not an overly sentimental person. 
and the ducks have just taken a little tiny piece of of uh, my Grinch heart, and they have um, they they just make me happy to see them. Uh, they are completely pets. They lay eggs, but we have so many chicken eggs that I usually just end up giving them to the chickens to eat because we have so many eggs. So they're really just pets in a way. And I've just gotten four more, if you can believe that, Kathy. And I did that just because we had this mated pair and we've gotten to know them so well over the last year that I'm, I'm recognizing that when a raccoon takes out one of them, because it will happen, you know, this, just to be realistic, it will probably break my heart. So I just needed to have more ducks there so it made it easier. <laughs> okay. I think that's the principle of the coming cicada swarm, too. <laughs> when, there's a, when there's enough extra, we won't be so heartbroken <laughs> when many of them, many of them uh, meet their demise. I know. And, and, and you know what? Ducks are, ducklings are so darn cute. They really yeah. are. They're, they're just they're fun. They don't hurt my garden at all. If they're wandering around my beds, I'm not concerned in the slightest. They're going to root around for larvae. They're going to root around for um, worms and things like that and greens, but they're not going to scratch up the ground. They're not going to take out um, things by mm-hmm. destroying the root zone. And so I don't mind them. Speaking of cicadas, uh, I don't know if you're going to have as much of the storm swarm there in Lovettsville, but how do you think your ducks and chickens will react to them? I don't know that that'll be really interesting to see because the last time they were here, I did not have chickens. I was actually battling for the right to have chickens in my um, home in Brunswick, which is across the river. And we were in a much smaller space and more of a city environment and I didn't have chickens. Um, So I, you know, I, I throw stink bugs by the handful to my chickens and they love them. So it'll be interesting. They are large and, and red eyed. So we'll see. I, I'm actually not too concerned about uh, the, the 17 year cicadas. Maybe that's the naive of me, but we didn't really have a terrible problem in Brunswick. I'm in a woods now. I, I might have more of a problem. I don't know. I do know that my California sister and her family and three children are coming to stay right in the middle of this and Uh. (laughs) if the gnats were not bad enough to stop them from ever considering a move to the to the east coast the cicadas will (laughs) will probably be the one-two punch or it could be a great attraction you never know they could fall in love with them that that's true they could become uh little uh, bug scientists right Mm mm-hmm yeah. And it's definitely a once in a lifetime or at least once in a generation uh, or childhood adventure to, to have them around. So another past uh, topic that we discussed together here on Garden DC podcast was the Philadelphia Flower Show. And this year it has been moved to June and outdoors. Are you planning on attending, Marianne? No, I really, really wanted to, but my, like I I said, I have family coming and this happens so rarely, uh, that, uh, I, I, I just put them first in, in sort of my plans. We're going to be showing them around this area and, and then I'm actually going to be taking a very small road trip with my sister back across the United States to California. So, um, it, it was so busy that I just said, I'm going to have to wait and see next year. Is it going to be outside again? I, I almost sort of hope it will be just to see what that feels like. Chelsea is so great having out, having it outside that maybe they'll find that it's a really great way to do it. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll see what happens with this year. I don't know if they've already made decisions because usually they do have to plan several years ahead. So We'll report back here on the Garden DC podcast, and maybe I'll even be able to record some live things this year outdoors at the Philadelphia Flower Show. So that'll, that'll be really interesting to see and, and see what the future holds. And maybe it'll be a hybrid. Maybe it'll be indoors in the convention center in March, and then they'll do a like part B outdoors in the summer again. So they could if, you know, have the best of both worlds in continuing years. There's something to be said for 
the that that anticipation of the spring season and when the show happens in you know sometimes it's the very last weekend in February the first weekend in March there's so much anticipation and it's so exciting because it's usually cold and miserable it's almost always snowing (laughs) yes or sleeting or freezing rain that's right and so I you know you sort of don't want to lose that by having it outside in the future but um I, it'll be fun to see what they end up doing. I'm sure that I'm sure they'll do an amazing job, whatever they end up doing. Yeah, I think it's exciting the, the possibilities and changes in store for the show. And for our other past topic, I think we had you on three times previously. So the third topic we discussed in the past were summer cocktails. So I was going to ask if you have a libation in your hand right now, but we're talking and recording fairly early in the morning. So I think uh, you'd be concerned if I did. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm guessing not, but you could have (laughs) an Irish coffee. I don't know. Uh, No judging here. And uh, so maybe we'll come back another time and and do, uh, since we only talk summer cocktails, maybe talk about other drinks for other seasons and future episodes. Yeah, that are garden inspired. I actually mm-hmm. have a garden or, or a tropically inspired cocktail that's in my book this, um, uh, that has to do with the red hibiscus or roselle. And a friend of mine came up with this sort of frozen gimlet. And uh, the recipe is on my website. They unfortunately they had to cut the recipes from the book because uh, they're you know they're always walk, looking at tech and how much text you can have. But the recipe the, there's pictures of it in the book, and um, it's a beautiful thing. It's just a lovely, lovely cocktail. And that brings up a a good point too of what you weren't allowed to put in the book. So, oh, so I'm going to I'm going to give you. <laughs> A venting space here, and not that we don't love our editors and publishers, oh, no. but there's a limit. And you know, with layout, and they want gorgeous big photos, and you want to provide the best information possible. So, what didn't make the book? That that's I'm so glad you bring this up, Kathy, because you're absolutely right. We do love our publishers and our editors, and they they're all working towards the success of a book, and they're looking very carefully at what is the marketplace. And you know, bottom line, it's not a Moby Dick uh, marketplace. <laughs> they don't want War and Peace, and they want uh, books that are that have a, a fair amount of uh, high contrast photos and smaller bits of text here and there. And so that was frustrating because I did want to have um, a lot more genera represented in the book. And I and I couldn't in the profiles. There just wasn't the text. And they're also looking for the ability to uh, have the book translated into other languages. And so those markets are very specific as well. So there's a lot to be thought about there. So when you're in a bookstore and you're picking up books and you're being fairly critical of them, I think it's better just to be critical of the culture in general because the marketplace, the, the books are responding to the marketplace. Um, but in terms of what didn't get into my book, yes, we had to take all those recipes out. Uh, in my Friends with Benefits chapter, uh, which is very cheekily named, but it's the uh, tropical plants that provide ornamental value in your garden, but you can also eat them. So they provide edible value as well. And I, I, because again, because of text, I couldn't get into medicinal value there. It, we just went with edibles, but we had to take the recipes out. Those went to my website, but there's some photos in, in that chapter. Uh, I had to get rid of, uh, some regional things that I wanted to have in there. Uh, like I said, some of the plant profiles I had to remove, um, some of the plant profiles I never, re- I never wrote. Uh, because there would they would have had to have been taken out, and uh, a couple interviews that I wanted to leave in, but um, those had to come out as well. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting dance mm-hmm. uh, that you dance, and um, it, a, and it does, as my editor tells me, gives you the opportunity to offer those things to your readers on your website, which is what I'll be doing next year. Um, I'll be going into 
more detail with modules uh, on my website for each of these categories with plants that I couldn't go into detail about because there are just so many and there's so many good ones and you know that you know somebody's going to pick up the book and they're going to read through it and then say oh I can't believe she didn't include clivia you know and and I, you know, I can't either, but there's only so much I can include. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah, it's great to be able to offer, say, bonus content or um, to be able to say uh, part two, maybe in the future. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to see that. What I would love to see is just uh, future editions that are just thicker, you know, that when you drop them, they make a bigger sound because they're just bigger <laughs> books. Um, they, can, they can be door stops and books. Uh in your, in your, in your office. Um, but I don't know if that, I don't know if that'll happen or not. (laughs) No, I have a friend who always likes to pick up, you know, random objects at say a tag sale or a thrift store. And if it's weighty, she says, that's quality. (laughs) Well, yes, that's how I pick cars too. You sort of give the door a little kick and see if it sounds tinny or not. Um, (laughs) nice. So speaking of the book and its content, uh, could you give us a quick rundown of the overall theme? And let's start with the title. Yes, the, the, the title is Tropical Plants and How to Love Them. And the subtitle is Building a Relationship with Heat-Loving Plants When You Don't Live in the Tropics. And so this is everybody who lives in temperate areas of the world and wants to experiment with these plants or has never really thought about experimenting with these plants, but sees them in really well-designed gardens. Because I'm I'm sure you've seen those strong, bold accents in some of your favorite gardens, haven't you, Kathy? Oh, yeah. And they're so striking when you see them and you're like, wow, you know, does does this fit in with my cottage garden? you know, kind of blousey perennials, mass, masses of color, or do I want more of these big, bold things to work in, this, this drama? And that's what I am trying to help people to do, is not just, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of how to grow them and how to overwinter them, but how to incorporate them successfully so that they don't look incongruous, you know, so they don't look oh, that's just sort of a weird accent sitting there on its own, you know, being large and bold and flamboyant. You want them to accentuate the rest of your garden to enhance it. And you particularly want them to do what they're great at, which is work hard in the summer and look great in our summer months. And particularly us in this area with the humidity that we endure, and I do mean endure, uh, these plants love it. They absolutely adore it. They respond to it. So consequently, I can leave. Uh, to I visited family last year uh, for a few weeks. And when I got back, my daughter had just watered one of the troughs that I had. Now, had it been filled with your classic uh, container annuals, they would have looked terrible with no care, no deadheading, what have you. As it was, it was a mixture of begonia and euphorbia milii, crown of thorns, and there was some carex in there, and there was tradescantia in there, and all of these tropicals that just said, hot dog, it's warm, I'm loving it. And it looked gorgeous when I came back. It looked like I'd been there all the time looking after it. So that's one of the things that these plants can do for us is they can really help us carry the garden through the summer season without necessarily having a tropical garden. Because Mm -hmm. I don't have a tropical garden. I know you don't. Mm -mm. Um, It's not all, it's not, it's not a zero sum thing. You know, you you don't have one (laughs) or the other. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think you've sold me on the set it for, set it and forget it aspect because <laughs> yeah. there's definitely the low maintenance part and, and then there's high maintenance parts and we'll we'll get into that for tropical plants. Uh, but you mentioned in that combination Tradescantia and that is a native, correct, to our there, area? There are some natives, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm not sure how far up and over that goes. I am... 
that. I can't tell you that without looking it up. But there are a lot of native plants that have um, very tropical overtones to them so that you can incorporate that feel without necessarily cheating on your natives. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, things like uh, Jack in the Pulpit, that's a really great one. Uh, big, large leaves, large spathe flowers. Uh, ostrich ferns, those oh, yeah. are, mm -hmm. boy, you can turn a whole area into Jurassic Park within the space of a year mm -hmm. <laughs> with uh, ostrich ferns and they are 100% native and deer proof. I can, I can say proof, can't I, Kathy? With oh those. yeah. Yeah. They might lay down on them, but they're not going to eat them. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. They might lay down <laughs> on them. Um, and those are, uh, yeah, those are star performers. I'm trying to think of some others. Help me out here with some native. Oh, for me, there's a couple of trees that look so tropical that are native to our area, which include pawpaw for, yeah. for the biggest one, just the fruit and the leaves themselves, but also the whole magnolia family. Um, yes. Definitely looks big and tropical. Microphylla and like, especially. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was going to say, there's a lot of hibiscus mm -hmm. that we, and I, and I remember as when we first moved out here 20 years ago, um, and I didn't have any experience with growing hibiscus at all. And I remember walking through a neighborhood and there were all these big, beautiful, very Hawaiian looking hibiscus. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's not possible. They can't grow here. They're so tropical looking. Um, it wasn't until much later that I realized, no, no, we've got tons of uh, very temperate hibiscus that that you can grow you don't have to go into tropical hibiscus now there are a lot of wonderful tropical hibiscus but if you just want that planted and forget it and give your garden a tropical look that is one of the best plants to get started with mm -hmm. and a couple of the vines are, are very tropical looking that are native here of course yeah. passiflora um with that if you dare if you yeah. dare to plant it yeah <laughs> keep it keep it in check but yeah to me the flower looks like it has the tiny ufo landing in the center yeah. um, this big beautiful almost clematis looking um flower to it and then there are so many of the tiny little ephemerals but you know that come and go so quick in mm -hmm. the native world but these that we're talking about, those are some of the longer lasting mm -hmm. um, natives in your garden. And, and even calicanthus, mm -hmm. so, you know, a nice background shrub for the, for the most of the rest of the year, has that really funky flower with a beautiful scent. And, and that sticks around for several weeks. Mm -hmm. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, plants that I term mock trops. They're not real tropicals, but they have a very tropical look to them. Some are native, some are not. Um, I have a list of those in, in uh, the book, which allows you to create, if you really want to create a tropical environment, but you just cannot um, envision yourself digging anything or storing anything, you can go over to these guys. Or if you want to have, say, a fully tropical looking garden, and forget about the temperate look completely. You can go over to maybe 75% of these guys and then add your ancetes, you know, your big red Abyssinian bananas, add your tropical hibiscus, uh, add your, your cannas or things that you're going to have to dig. Here we're going to have to dig cannas, although last winter, yeah, no digging. And you may mm -hmm. not have to dig cannas, huh, Kathy? No, I actually left two big pots out all winter. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're back. <laughs> so I, I was like, I don't really care about you at this point. <laughs> I was at that point of the year that if they didn't come back, I wouldn't be too upset. But yeah, they're back. And most cannas, um, at least in the close in DC area or inside the beltway can be left in the ground now without it, without issue. So that does bring us to maybe walking through the year of uh, tropical garden maintenance. So um, starting off maybe March, April, do you take your bulbs and corms out of storage and pot them up early uh, to give them a head start for going outside? Or do you wait and directly plant them in the ground? I do a little bit of both. 
on really good years when I've got my stuff together, uh, I do get pretty much everybody potted up sort of mid-March uh, and put into cold frames to start boosting heat. And uh, some of them, like the gingers, I may have started even a little earlier than that um, and kept them inside under lights uh, just for a couple weeks, give them that little bit of extra. Uh, but some years I don't get anything done as quickly as I want to. And in fact, this year, the majority of my tropicals are out. They're in cold frames. My bananas are out of the garage and they're sitting against the wall right now, just sort of acclimatizing to being back, back outside. But I still have a huge bag of, uh, one variety of canna that really needs to go in the garden and really needed to go into cold frames so that it would be nice and big and bulky right now, but I didn't have time for it. Um, that's okay. That's what this book is about. This book is, hey, how is your life working? And how can you make these tropical plants work around your life rather than the other way around? Because we don't want to be a slave to them. You don't want to, oh gosh, I've got to, I have to do that. It should be fun. Um, it should be work, but it should be fulfilling work. And mm -hmm. it, you don't necessarily want to do the same thing every year. First off, that's boring. And once I, 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 that's how I am with like Christmas decorations. Like I've got to use my Christmas decorations in very different ways every year. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I can't be bothered to pull them out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sort of like, I'll just leave them. So I like to do the same thing with tropical plants, and that might be using less or using more or not using some at all. Uh, this year, there are a couple seeds that I never got started that I usually would start right about now, or I'm sorry, a, a few weeks ago, and some seeds that I started late. So yes, I, I start, I'm thinking about all this stuff at the end of February, um, I've, you know, I've probably bought anything in that I was going to, to buy by then and, um, and then see what sort of takes my fancy at garden centers. And then they, they sit there and they cook and I, I, uh, babysit them. I don't have a greenhouse. Well, I say that I do have a greenhouse. It's sitting on a pallet in front of my barn. <laughs> <laughs> it just arrived. So but next I year you're going to be cheating on us. <laughs> I'll be cheating a little bit. Um, and now I monitor cold frames like I would a greenhouse. And they can be very temperamental. They can build heat very, very quickly. And so you have to be, you have to be on it um, and, and watching them and making sure you're closing them up at night. And if it's going to get really cold, maybe putting another blanket over the top of them and, and those sort of things. But I, I'm saying all that. These are not worst case scenarios, but these are the lot of work scenarios. Uh, people can experiment with tropical plants by just going out this year and buying a red Abyssinian banana, you know, a little, say, foot and a half specimen with the understanding in their brain that they're going to throw it away at the end of the season. And they may spend $12.99 on that plant, but they're going to have it for the next five to six months. And it's, that is value for money. That is, you know, how much does it cost to get a bouquet of flowers, Kathy? About that. Yeah, except for they don't last five, six months. So by the end of the season, that banana is going to be five or six feet tall. And then at the end of the season, you can stick with your original, hey, this was just for a summer romance. This was just, it, it brought beautiful uh, drama to my deck or to my patio or to my garden but now it's done and it goes in the compost pile and enriches the soil or enriches your chickens or whatever it is uh, and then start again next year or you can decide I'm going to try and store that I'm, I'm going to see if I will learn something about storing that so we have choices with these plants we don't have to do the same thing to them every year um, we don't have to do what everybody else is doing uh, and uh, I, I think we have, there's a lot of tropical plant enthusiasts that are just they're they're you know they they want to make sure that they're getting everything through every single year 
and they're getting rich and they get very rare plants and that can put off people who just want to dabble a little bit because they feel like oh I'm not that serious but those are really cool plants and that that's who I'm talking to you can mm-hmm. do it and I think part of that might be uh, frugality. I'm going to throw that in yeah. there and that you're like, okay, that cost me $10, but it cost me more in sweat equity <laughs> and, yeah. and input. I gave that great soil. I gave it some great fertilizer, say, so I want, I want that to carry over. So that does bring up, um, say, cost. And you talked about starting some plants from seeds that can keep some of the cost down. Um, what specifically do you start from seed every year? Oh, lots of things. And and I and real quick before I get into that list, mm-hmm. I want to make it clear to you. Well, you know, you we, you know, we we stay together a lot. I am extremely frugal, and I have been throughout my gardening career. Um and so I am that person that's sort of like, "Oh, I don't I spent money on that." I actually have a little section in the book that says a message to frugal gardeners. <laughs> you know, it says here's here's how we're thinking about this and I, mm-hmm. I recognize where you're coming from um but that you're right Kathy that's a great way to go is seed rearing because seeds are fairly cheap and you can like for instance uh, grow a castor bean uh, which is ricinus and put four of those into seed trays and you'll have four huge plants by July uh, that that cost you next to nothing. They cost you some time, but they cost you next to nothing. Papaya can create a 12 to 15 foot tree from one seed sown back in February. That's, that's value for money. And then of course, there's all of those uh, wonderful annuals that you know, some of us use uh, already, uh, whether it's the purple hyacinth bean vine. I mean, think about how much value for money that is. I've got some of those sprouting right now. Um, or something like Mirabilis four o'clocks. That's a fantastic, uh, very, very colorful annual. And uh, I like salmon sunset, but I think is that that's probably my very favorite. Hmm. Do you grow Mirabilis? Yeah, I have a few, and I was going to also say coleus and taking cuttings. That that kind of is for me the most frugal gardening I do of all, aside from seed saving and seed starting, mm-hmm. is making sure that I save uh, a few stem cuttings from my favorite coleus from the previous year, and get those to winter over to to put out for the next year. Yes. So I talk a lot about taking cuttings of your plants and that's actually, I put into the high maintenance partners chapter and, you know, really serious gardeners might say high maintenance. That's not high maintenance, but think about it. If you're, you know, if I take some coleus cuttings or I take some alternathera or, oh gosh, uh, Ruelia, I always take Ruelia. Sometimes I take um, uh, Lantana. And I start those. I have to look after them over the winter time. You know, they become a house plant without the the beauty of a house plant, and then they need to be transplanted. They need to be hardened off and put back in the garden. So that does take a little bit of time, but it is absolutely the most frugal way you can go. Even more frugal than seeds, unless you've um, collected your own seeds. So you've amassed your collection of plants or grown from seed or cuttings. How do you do your combinations, Marianne? Do you look for um, foliage that looks great against each other? What are you looking out for? I'm looking out for contrast first and foremost, you know, how the shape of leaves uh, go uh, work against each other. For instance, like pairing a, a large wide canna leaf with a an elegant feathery grass like panicum or miscanthus or something like that or or penicetum uh, i love those contrasts in in the shape and the form of a plant and the color of foliage i have to be a little careful actually because i'll almost go kaleidoscope by the time i'm done you know sort of look around going wow there is a lot of color going on around here I don't tend to be a gardener who 
plants for flower uh, because foliage is with me all season and the flower usually is just you know for a small amount of that time with the exception of some plants like dahlias like marabolus um, like uh, hibiscus you know some plants you're actually planting for that flower and when you're doing that you've got to be really careful uh, that that because these are often very vibrant colors that you're allowing for that when you're putting that foliage in uh, it, sometimes the blossoms can take you by surprise. Like if you're by, if you're if you're planting canna in order to get that dramatic foliage, and all of a sudden it it's it strikes out with this huge, let's say scarlet, red, orange flower, and you despise orange, <laughs> you're going to have to go around hacking those flowers off. So there's a lot of things to think about. But I'm looking at contrast first. I'm also looking at uh, areas that are wetter or drier. You know, that really makes a difference with tropical plants and how much care and extra water I might have to give them. So um, that's, a, that's a big deal to me. Uh, I, love, um, I love that lush feeling. And I don't like the starved look. So, so I'm trying to, trying to put them in the places that are best for them. And so for extra care, um, are you talking about specific fertilizer schedule? How do you, how do you care for your tropicals? Well, you know, I am a lazy gardener at the end of the day and I do fertilize them heavily when I pot them up and then they go into, they go into pots and they go from that pot into the garden. Uh, they should be fertilized on, depending on what, depending on how um, how long that that long release fertilizer is that you put in. They should be fertilized at least once a month. I sometimes don't do that. <laughs> I have to say, I really. I, my soil is, is good soil in the places where I put them. It's pretty rich soil. So I'm usually doing okay with that. But I will use a little bit of organic um, fertilizer. I use a spoma at the end of the season, not the end of the season, but sort of mid-season in there. I don't tend to use foliar, foliage uh, feed except with my container plants because they get that gets leached out pretty quick. I play it by ear with them, but I don't think you should go into to tropicals thinking I'll never have to feed them mm -hmm. um, because they are heavy feeders and, and they also are usually heavy drinkers. Um, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they need their own Betty Ford clinic. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. And when the growth does respond and it starts to get to that point, I, I'm going to call it late July, early August, I'm not sure if it's the same for, for all of us, that you just want to hack and slash back. So all mm -hmm. of a sudden your sweet potato vines have taken over the world. Um, do you think that's the most amount of maintenance time or do you just let things run wild? What would be my most amount of maintenance when things are in the ground? Yeah, yeah, sweet potato vine, yeah, that is, I think my containers take the most amount of maintenance from me. Uh, because to a certain extent, the foliage on so many of the tropicals, whether it's the gingers, the cannas, the elephant ears, the bananas, they block a lot of light. And so consequently, they block a lot of weed seed that would germinate otherwise. So I don't have as many problems in the garden. But in containers, there's only a certain amount of space, and these plants are very vigorous. And containers take a fair amount of time to trim and and you know give a haircut and and make sure that they're getting enough feed those do need to get fed more I, I can't skate on those I do have to feed those uh, and they need to obviously be watered so yeah I think maintenance for containers would probably be my biggest uh, my biggest issue mm -hmm. and so towards the end of the growing season um, maybe it's early October or so, um, how do you uh, 
excise your collection? <laughs> do, <laughs> the accentize. <laughs> yes. Do you uh, throw things in the compost pile? How do you make your decision of what's a keeper? What am I going to put effort into? What's going to come back next year? And what am I going to give storage space to? Because like many of us, I'm sure storage space is limited. That's right. Well, first off are those more rare plants that... Uh, like for instance, it's not it's not rare, but it's something that I might not be able to get at my local nursery, like Cissus discolor, uh, Rex begonia vine. Sometimes my nurseries have it, sometimes they don't. So I'm that's something that can store in the basement. So I'm going to grab that. That gets rack space. And basically, I have two large audiovisual racks from like the 80s from schools, and they can wheel around. And if it can't fit on that rack, then I can't store it because we, I, we have limited space too. And so whether it gets rack space or not depends on first off how rare it is and how easily I can get hold of it. And if I liked it, obviously. Plenty of rare things I've grown that I didn't like and didn't care if they died at the end of the season. Um... And whether it can come into the house as a house plant is a completely different thing and, and make the house look good. And how many of something I need. Canna's just go, just bonzo in the garden. And so you end up, you know, if you put a couple uh, rhizomes in, you're going to end up with probably a, a factor of five or six more, you know, to that. And you have to decide, do I really want that many? And that's where, that's where I make those decisions, not in the spring. I don't, de I don't dig everything and then make the decisions in the spring, which am I going to save? Because I would want to save everything. In the fall, I'm tired. I'm, I'm haggard. I'm I'm at the end of my garden and so I can make those decisions so much faster. Um nope, I don't need that. I only need about 5 of those. Nope, I only need, you know, a couple of those. And so I can just leave them be, let them rot back into the garden. If they're if if it's a really nice uh fall tableau that is going to be ruined by the the foliage of brown uh, tropicals, then I'll, I'll cut them out and put them on the compost pile. But a lot of times they'll just uh, die in place and add to the soil. Nice. And I was looking at the edible garden choices for tropicals and just thinking how fun it would be to make a little um, arrangement, so to speak, or vignette in an edible garden of tropicals. So I was thinking about okra and of course the sweet potato vine can also work there. Are there other tropicals that you think about that could be in that edible category? There sure are. The, you know, the gingers for one, turmeric, uh, and lemongrass. There, there is a beautiful uh, ornamental plant. Mm -hmm. And, and boy, is that, I, I do a lot of, um, a lot of Southeast Asian cooking. And that is such a beautiful flavor in there. Um, there are some wonderful, wonderful uh, beans, the long Chinese noodle beans. I Those are so beautiful. The darker ones. Have you ever grown those, Kathy? Mm -hmm. And even now that you see the Asian vegetables, uh, bitter melon mm -hmm. and, and some of the squashes could also look really cool and exotic in a, in a tropical bed. Yes. Um, I have, I have in the book, I have a, a section on growing a green curry bed. That's, you know, how people grow, here's a pizza bed or a spaghetti bed. Mm -hmm. I said, let's do one for green curry. So you put your Thai basil in there and you put um, some hot peppers in there and you put a bean in there and some lemongrass and maybe some galangal or another ginger um, and an eggplant. And all of the things that you sort of need for curry, and you can plunge a um, recruit lime, a kaffir lime in there too, that can then go inside if you plunge it in its pot. Uh, so you can have all those tastes right there uh, in a, just like you would with a pizza bed, just a little <laughs> bit different. And then throw, you know, throw something in for color. You could throw a dahlia in for color. You could throw a marabolus in for color. Just don't eat those. 
No. <laughs> well, yeah. actually, dahlias you can eat uh, mm-hmm. dahlia tubers, but they're not they're not particularly yummy, and mm. and they're fairly expensive. Yeah, I was gonna say a little pricey for what what little taste you get out of them. I uh, go so daylily. You, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So everything but maybe the coconut milk. Everything but maybe the coconut milk. I haven't figured out a way to to have those. Uh, coconut palms in my garden <laughs> no and I, I don't know that I need to but uh, you can't mm-hmm. grow absolutely everything right but you can you can grow a fair amount and mm-hmm. even if you're not going to make the um the paste that you you would put together with all of those spices and you're going to use a paste putting these fresh ingredients into that curry is going to just pop it up flavor wise it's like it's like taking a can of spaghetti sauce off the pantry and then adding fresh oregano, adding fresh garlic, adding fresh onion. That that's it, it it suddenly turns that canned sauce into something special. And, and now you can do that. And now you're making me starving. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking about that curry. Uh, so um, now that we're talking about plants, you said we can't have everything. So maybe to wrap up our discussion today, what are maybe the one, two, three plants that if you could grow anything in the world, you would want to add to the mid-Atlantic temperate climate? Oh, what would I like to not have to dig, you mean, but still Mm -hmm. be able to grow? Exactly. Or a plant that maybe you can't even grow in our climate that that you've tried a few times. Oh yeah, there are things. It's, it's there are things that are only just one zone off of me. Um, you know, things like uh, Scylla peruviana. I can grow it this year, but next year I probably won't be able to. Um, but in terms of tropicals, if I didn't have to dig my red Abyssinian bananas, I would be so happy. Mm-hmm. Um, every year I do because they add so much to the garden and. Of all of my plants that make people go, well, what's that? Those are the plants that get the most attention, and particularly from non-gardeners who, who you know, they may not be gardeners, but they go, is that a banana? And I also grow uh, Musa Basju, which is the hardy banana. And I don't have to dig that. And it's just so fantastic because it comes back and it's so gorgeous and so tropical. But the red Abyssinian banana is, you know, you've got that incredible color, that deep, deep red in the foliage. So I would like to not dig that. I would like to not have to dig my dahlias. But even if I didn't dig my dahlias or my cannas, uh, the voles would get them. Mm-hmm. So over a long winter, so you know, there's a, there's a couple different reasons, you know, why I I can't grow those. I would probably have a trachycarpus as well, a windmill palm, uh, if I was just say a little bit warmer. I could grow one right now, but it would look um, emaciated and sad and burnt and unhappy and reproachful. So I don't. <laughs> yeah I, I was looking at um some photos of touring in the pacific northwest and i think the only thing i would like from their collections is the cycads oh I, yeah. I could use a couple of those cycads yeah that would be beautiful you're absolutely right i do that too um i i would like to be able to increase my begonia collection outside too but you know, a lot of breeders are working on making hardier and hardier begonias. Um, our friend uh, John Bogan is is doing a lot of work with cre- going beyond just begonia grandis, which is our our hardy begonia here, um, and making much more colorfully making you know breeding. Sorry, he doesn't make them, but breeding much more colorful leaves uh, and. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful plants that have a great deal of hardiness and can come through our winters. I think that they're in the process of uh, actually getting some of those out to the public. If I, I might be speaking out of turn, but. Well, something to look out for in, in future years for trialing and, and then at our local garden centers. 
So to let our listeners know how to contact you, how to order your book and follow up with you, uh, how do they do that? Yes. So um, if you are in the this area um, and you want to sort of see the book in person or, or, or see me in person talking about the book and some of these plants, there will we're going to have our big book launch at Thanksgiving Farms in Frederick, Maryland next Saturday on the 22nd and and things begin at one o'clock and not that it should draw you but Thanksgiving Farms is not just an incredible plant nursery it also has the Mad Science Brewing Company so if your significant other needs something to do they can you know sit and try some of those wonderful beers while you talk tropicals with me Um, I'll be there signing and and selling copies of my book and talking about some of these plants. And we're going to be giving away a few wonderful things as well as a couple copies of the book. Uh, If you just want to read a little bit um, online, I have plenty of little bits of articles uh, on my website, smalltowngardener.com or mariannewolburn.com will also take you there. And the book is available from Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all of the the big retailers. Um, And it soon will be available on my website as well. Right now you can just uh, get a signed copy of Big Dreams Small Garden, but I have to to set it up so so we can get signed copies out to folks too of this book. And hopefully I'll have that done within the next couple weeks. Great. So that book signing for people who might be listening to the podcast um, is May 22nd, 2021. So if you're listening to it after that, you miss that. <laughs> but you can right. still visit her uh, on social media and at her website. And any final thoughts or of encouragement to those who are, as we said in the beginning, a little trepidatious about adding tropical plants to their gardens? Let's say you've just been walking past these plants in the garden center and you're seeing more and more of them. And that's not, um, that's not just your imagination. They're becoming more popular. You're seeing them more in garden centers, outside, not just inside as, as um, house plants. And you're feeling like you just want to dabble. Just go with the flow. Grab that impulse purchase. Get it. And just have a little fling. It doesn't have to be, as my friend um, <laughs> says, marriage and a picket fence, which I think is fantastic. Um, you can just have a little bit of fun. And you may find that they add so much to your garden that you want to have a little fun next year, too. So don't be afraid of them. You're not cheating on your native plants if you do a tropical. Because they're not going to take over your garden. (laughs) They can't. They can't. They don't have the ability to. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate talking to you. Strawberry plant profile. Strawberries. Sweet, luscious, juicy. No wonder this fruit is blushing. Strawberries are one of the most loved edibles. They can be eaten straight from the plant, used in jam or dessert recipes, or frozen and enjoyed in mixed drinks and shakes throughout the year. Not only is it versatile in the kitchen, it's also amazingly easy to grow. Strawberry growing can be as simple as a pot on your patio or hanging by your back door. Set aside a three foot by three foot bed in your garden and you can have strawberry crops for the next few years. Strawberries grow best in a raised bed of well-drained soil located in full sun. Mix in plenty of organic material. Plant out strawberry crown divisions during the early spring. The first year may not yield much of a crop. Strawberry plants will then send out runners. You can cut them off or guide them back into the bed. Some experts recommend pinching off all flowers and runners during the first year to get big crops the following year. The plant peaks at three years old, so you will need to add new stock every few years to replenish them. They are perennials in zones five to eight. Put the new bare root plants in so the crown is just resting at soil level 
with the roots gently fanned out beneath the surface. They need only about one inch of water per week and are prone to root rot, so don't overdo it on the watering. There are many kinds of strawberries. The two main are ever-bearing and june-bearing. As per their names, ever-bearing and june-bearing fruit at different times. June-bearing from late May to mid-June, while ever-bearing can have several waves of berries throughout the summer. Select June-bearing if you want one large crop for making jams or freezing. Choose ever-bearing if you want to throw some fresh berries in your cereal bowl every few days. Some popular varieties to try are Early Glow, Northeaster, and Dar Select. Relatively disease-free compared to other fruits you may grow, they are plagued by a few pests, most notably slugs and birds. To combat slugs, sprinkle around the beds with sluggo iron phosphate, which is safe for use around edibles. For birds, put some shiny moving objects nearby. You might also consider investing in screening or bird netting to cover the beds as the fruits ripen. In the fall, mulch a strawberry bed with straw, not hay, or other materials such as pine needles to insulate the plants over the winter. Remove the mulch again in spring. The strawberry flowers themselves are very pretty, usually white or light pink. Some varieties are grown more for their decorative value than for the fruit. The pink panda, aka strawberry potentia, is especially attractive with its bright pink blooms. Strawberry plants also make good border plantings. They stay low and are fairly tidy. The runners are easy to pull up if they go astray. If you choose alpine varieties, you will not have a runner problem. So don't hesitate to plant a row of strawberries on the front edge of your flower beds for a sweet treat every time you pass by. Strawberries, you can grow that. What's new this week? Well, first I have to thank a new listener supporter, Jennifer Whalen, and then thank all of you for listening to this podcast. It means a lot to me. Out in the garden, I've been picking radishes and also radish seed pods. Yes, the seed pods, while still green and not dried yet, are edible and pretty yummy. I'm going to talk about those a little bit more in the next issue of Washington Gardener magazine, so look out for that. And in my ornamental garden, I'm really enjoying the irises. The bearded irises smell so good. To me, it's like grape soda or grape bubble gum. I love that scent. And so many things are looking really beautiful and lush right now. Clematis vines, the hookera are starting to put up their little wands of flower bursts. And I'm starting to see signs of many of my pollinator garden plants about to burst into bloom from the penstemon to the milkweed. They've sent up long stalks and are getting ready for that summer ahead. In local gardening events, coming up is the Annapolis Secret Garden Tour. And this is Saturday, June 5th and Sunday, June 6th from noon to five each day. You can find out about it at the Hammond Harwood House website. And it features private gardens in the historic district Murray Hill area. And it's such a treat to be able to access some of those gardens that you'd never be able to see just walking around downtown Annapolis. So check that tour out. Another local garden tour that's a great deal of fun and gets you access to some little bit hidden areas is the Beyond the Garden Gates Garden Tour in downtown Frederick. And that runs from Saturday, May 15th through Sunday, May 23rd, every day from 9 a.m. till about dusk. And you can find out more about that at celebratefrederick.com. Uh, Another upcoming event that I'm really excited to announce is that Washington Gardener Magazine will be taking up a coach bus of 
folks again to the Philadelphia Flower Show. So we didn't know if it could happen again this year um, because of all the changes, because of COVID, and we found out a way to do it safely. We are requiring that all of our guests on the trip be fully vaccinated and wear their masks. Um, And we are really excited to see what this new Philadelphia Flower Show format will be like outdoors in early June at the FDR Park in Philadelphia. So hopefully you'll be hearing more about that show and trip in future episodes of this podcast. Happy gardening, everyone. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.